Okay. How many of you have seen the movie Schindler's List? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. Do you remember in the movie where naked women and naked little children were being led towards the showers? And as you remember from the movie, instead of the showers, it, they were gassed. So instead of water, they let them gas. That's how my mother and my three younger sisters died in Auschwitz after I have already been uh, out of Ge Poland in Germany in a slave labor camp. When the German troops invaded our city, which was very close to the German border, uh, the same day they pulled out men from their homes, what they called the intelligentsia, the educated people, and they shot them right in front of their homes to prevent any organized resistance to their occupation. Myself and my brother, we were rounded up and a group of other boys, my age, at that time I was 14 years old, to pick up those bodies uh, on the street, uh, cart them out in little wagons to the uh, to a um, grave or really to a hole that was dug for, for, mass, uh, for mass burial. But two weeks later, I happened to be caught again, rounded up in the street, uh, to, and I was taken out with a, a bunch of other boys to dig up those corpses what an awful job for a 14-year-old boy. What an awful feeling to, to handle dead people, these corpses. So we dug them out and put them out on the field so they could be identified by their respective families. And the Jewish people were buried in the Jewish cemetery the Poles in the Catholic cemetery. Uh, Poland is predominantly Catholic. I don't know, maybe 90%? I'm not quite sure that we're all Catholics. Uh, within a few days, we had to wear an armband with the, na with the word Jude on it. Jude means Jew in German. Later on, the Arbent was uh, given up for the, uh, for the sign, for the yellow uh, sign that we had to sew on on our clothing, on the front of the jacket or shirt, on the back of the pants. We had to, to cut out the hole and then sew it on so you couldn't just remove it uh, when, when you wanted it and be, uh, you were recognized right away. We were also issued ration cards to buy food, to buy bread. I remember staying in line for over two hours in front of the bakery hoping to buy a, a loaf of bread. I had the coupon for it and I had the money, but they ran out of bread. And the same thing happened in the grocery stores where you were looking to buy some potatoes or some cabbage or beets. Uh, the, uh, the food was uh, uh, taken away from by the Germans, sent into Germany 
for their own people and we were starved right from the beginning of the war. But as you remember in your story, the war broke out on the 1st of September 1939. 1939, I was 14 years old. Uh, later, when I was 15, to get a ration card also, and to get, get a, a little payment, I started to work in a factory making uh, uh, cupboards for the German troops to hang their clothes. My father was a cabinet maker. Actually, he was making his bedroom sets. And uh, uh, his shop was in the kitchen. We had two rooms, a kitchen and one bedroom. We were poor, poor working people. So I picked up a little bit of his the trade. I learned a little bit about the tools and I did get that job. I worked there for maybe five, six, seven months. I don't know. Uh, we had no calendars and I lost knowledge the time. Uh, and one day our factory where I was, was surrounded with uh, German police and German regular soldiers and they had a list. I was on the list. About 40 or 50 of us were taken out from that factory. We were taken to an empty building, a school. Jewish kids were not allowed to go to school, whether you were 7 or 17 or any age. School was forbidden. I was 14 years old. I managed to get grade seven. I envy you. I envy you that you will be able to finish high school and maybe even go to university. You are lucky. This is the only envy that I ever had is education. So we were taken into the building, an empty school, because Jewish kids were not allowed to school. The building was empty. And uh, somebody called me to the second floor window. Your father, the, my father, is trying to say goodbye to me. I saw him. I saw him talk to me. But I didn't hear what he said, but I still visualized that he was apologizing to me because the previous night we had an argument, a verbal fight. And he said to me, you know, you're 15 years old, 16 years old, just about, maybe it's time for you to move out. He was already out at that age learning a trade. Yes, I was moved out the next morning into Germany, into a slave labor camp. Our camp was surrounded with barbed wire and guards. We had to undress completely and we were issued prison uniform the gray and gray striped uniforms that you've probably seen in the movies, the old prison uniforms. That's what we had to wear. Our hair was completely cut off and a stripe was shaved out from the front of the head to the very back, about this wide, like two fingers wide. So if you attempt a to escape, you would have been recognized immediately. We were assigned to, to a barracks, about 100 people 
men, all Jewish men, assigned to the barracks. The camp was 2,000 people. We were issued a, a piece of bread and a cup of ersatz coffee. Ersatz is in German means imitation coffee. And that's what we had every morning, is a piece of bread before we went out to work, and a cup of imitation coffee, sometimes a spoonful of marmalade, or a little piece of margarine, sometimes. For supper in the evening, a bowl of soup either cabbage soup or beet soup. And the next day again, either cabbage soup or beet soup. But if you were lucky, you might find a piece or two of potatoes in your soup, if it was from the bottom of the kettle. And that's what we talked about before falling asleep. Were you lucky to find a piece of potato? There was no meat at all. No dairy, no milk, no cheese of any kind. We went out, we marched to work. In my group, it took us, I think a little less than an hour to get to work. We were marched, maybe 50 or 60 of us in the, in the group where I was. My first job was working in a factory making V1 and V2 missiles. The missiles that the Germans shot over Britain. Later on, I worked on construction of the German highway, they call it the Autobahn. The Autobahn is the main highway going through Germany, and we worked on it, the expansion of the highway. No machinery of any kind, pick and ax, all by hand, we we're working building a highway. I worked at it for many months, and I don't know, maybe 10, 12 months, 14 months, I'm not quite sure. And then I was transferred to another camp where they needed men to work on laying railway lines. So we had to prepare uh, the ground, and we had to prepare the laying of the, of the railway lines, very hard work, very heavy, the railway lines. <coughs> we worked like slaves. We were beaten at work by the capo. Capo, C-A-P-O. It's an Italian word. It means a boss, a foreman. They, they still use the word capo in Italian. Uh, the mafia uses it. Uh, the bosses in the, in the mafia. The work was very hard. We were beaten in the camp and at work and in between marching to and from to work. We worked six days a week, 12 hours a day, hard work, very little food. We, we were starved, people were dying, 
people were committing suicide, they couldn't handle it any longer, and we envied them for having the guts to do it. I worked in that camp. I was in nine different camps as a slave laborer, and then later on as a, in a concentration camp. So, and from Fünftagen we were moved to Groß Rosen. Those are names of, of the little towns. Near every little town, near every bigger town, near every city, there was some type of a camp either a slave labor camp or a concentration camp. Slave labor camps were guarded by the regular army. The concentration camps were guarded by the SS troops. There came a time when the, when the rumors started to go around that our camp of 2,000 men is too small to operate. So we're going to be moved into a concentration camp. And when people heard it, people were hanging themselves, from using their long underwear or their towels tied together at the, from the rafters of the, of the outhouse. I myself have seen near my barrack where I stayed about four or maybe five people that hung themselves. And there were many barracks and many dozens of people that did commit suicide. So the day came that we were moved over by foot to the concentration camp but they already had 6,000 people, plus 2,000 from our camp, or nearly 2,000. And when we came in into, onto that camp, we stood at the parade ground for maybe two hours, waiting to be admitted to, our, to the barracks that we were assigned to. So the commandant, that means the head of the camp, in German it's called the commandant, who was maybe a captain or major in the SS. And he greeted us and he said, here you will not be treated as Jews. Here you will be equal with all the others with the people that are in my camp, in his camp, the thieves, the murderers, the homosexuals, the pedalists, the communists, deserters from German army, all different people that were brought in from the jails into the concentration camps as an example of what you could expect from my camp, his camp. He asked one of the kapos, kapo had an armband here and said C-A-P-O, kapo. He asked one of the kapo, who happened to be a Czech from Czechoslovakia, he said, show them. And the guy pulled out a man, maybe 19 or 20 years of age, maybe 5 foot 10 or 11, an average looking young man, kicked him in the groin, the man fell over, he stomped on his st stomach, on his throat, on his genitals. He killed the man in front of us. 
as an example of what we could expect in this concentration camp. And then we were assigned to our barracks and in the barrack we had bunks, three tier bunks. We had straw mattresses with a straw pillow and a little blanket, two people, <coughs> two people to each bunk, two men. We were all men. And groups of 40, 50, 60 men every morning marched out, were counted out at the, at the gate, marched out to work, and we were beaten by the guards with the uh, rifles and kicked, and, and we worked like slaves. And that's exactly what we were, slaves in Germany. So I was there for another year or more, and I don't know exactly how long, in that camp. And we were guarded by the SS troops, and they were mean as, as mean as could be. They beat you for no apparent reason, just for the fun of it, when they got drunk, they aim their rifles to see if they can hit somebody, if they can shoot someone, how good they are when they were still drunk. And you were not allowed to go to the, to the outhouse, to the washroom. We were not allowed to get out, to go out of the barrack. I mean, there was no toilets in the barracks. So people, sometimes when they were not well, they lost their feelings and they just ran through from one bunk into the other bunk. I learned very fast to sleep on the top bunk. So I shouldn't get back, I shouldn't get wet by the pee of other people. And towards the end of 1944, we started to hear rumors that the Russian troops are occupying Eastern Europe, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and we heard that they're starting to invade into eastern Germany, and our camp was in eastern Germany, where I was. So the order came from Berlin or whatever to move us. So we put, they put us onto a train, cattle cars, about 100 into each cattle car, three days, four nights, no food, no water, no toilet facilities. We were so tightly packed that we slept the first night or two leaning against each other. That's how we fell, fell asleep, I remember. But then eventually people were dying and they were lying on the floor in those, uh, in those cattle cars. We sat on them. And the bullies who happened to be Poles and Ukrainians, 
because I recognize the voice, the, the language. I, I spoke Polish. I went to Polish school. And Ukrainian is very similar to Polish. It's a Slavic language. So they were throwing Jewish men, young men, and not so young men, out through those little windows from the cattle cars. And I was afraid, being so small, they're going to throw me out. So because I went to school in grade one and two, where I was the only Jewish kid among all Catholics, I learned how to cross myself and how to pray to Mother Mary, to Jesus, in Polish. And I did it right in front of those bullies. And they assumed that I was a good little Catholic boy. I was very small, short, thin. When I was liberated, I did weigh 79 pounds. Skin and bones. We finally did arrive after three days and four nights. And they opened up those, those doors of the cattle car. And we were greeted by couples screaming to get out, get out. And we were greeted by the SS troops with the German Shepherd dogs that they always had beside them that I dreamt of for about 25 years after I was already in Winnipeg in Canada. Ask my wife, oh, I'm sorry, you don't ask my wife. My wife died last Wednesday. So my wife had to wake me up many, many times because I was trying to run away. I was always chased by these German Shepherd dogs and by the high leather boots that the SS men always wore. I didn't see their bodies. I just saw from the knees down the high leather boots. So we were greeted by them, and we were assembled, five abreast, and then they brought out the dead, the corpses. And I'm not exaggerating, I think maybe half of us had died in these cattle cars. And they had 20, 25 cattle cars of 100 each. They piled up those corpses like driftwood, five feet high, one atop the other, near every cattle car. I don't know how many hundreds of corpses they were there. And they finally, in small groups, they led us into the camp, into Buchenwald concentration camp, to be first, to go into a shower and to be deloused. We were full of lies under the um, between the legs, on the head, we were full of lies. So we had to climb up a ladder to jump into the cattle car, which might have been maybe 15 or 20 feet in diameter, five feet high, because you had to walk up the ladder, the ladder, jump in into that disinfectant water that killed the lice. And did it also hurt when you had scratches and boils on your body, 
on your arms, on your legs, on your sides. It burned like hell. We had to dunk your head because the head was full of lice. And then you came out and we had no towels. We had to dry ourselves off with our own clothing. And somebody said to, the, uh, to another guy, right in front of me actually, right beside me, said to him, no, here you won't be a big shot, you won't be a couple, even though that you are half German and half Polish. I, it was right beside me, I overheard it. And, and the guy answered in Polish, where water flowed, water shall flow again. What he meant is, if I was a couple, I'll be a couple again. So somebody hit him over the head with a wooden stool. They threw him head first into the disinfectant water, into the kettle. He came out alive. They threw him against the ceiling. They killed the man. Once they, had, once they hit him, they had to kill him already. So they killed the man. I nearly fainted from watching it. And they threw his body, naked body, wet, out into the snow in front of the uh, uh, bathhouse, or whatever it's called, you would call it. Nobody came in to ask what happened to him, how he died. See, near every barrack, every morning, there was a half a dozen or more people that have died in their sleep. People that, have, that were nearly dead or dead completely, and they were picked up, they were taken out and thrown onto a pile near the steps of, of the barrack and carted away on those little wagons, four, five, six men on every little cart. I chased after one that I saw a good pair of shoes that he was still wearing. Mine were completely worn down. I had no soles left on my shoes. My feet were wrapped in cement bags, in the paper of cement bags, to keep my feet warm, to keep them dry, because they were completely worn down. But the guy jerked. Maybe he wasn't completely dead. I didn't get his shoes. He, to me, he was dead, and I ran away. And they were buried every morning, way out near the, uh, near the um, uh, electric fence. Yeah, we were guarded. With, a, uh, with two lines of electrified barbed wire fences. If you managed to get through one, you still had another one to go through, and uh, the guards in their towers would realize right away. And actually, they would shoot you. So, we were assigned to barracks. By the way, Buchenwald concentration camp that I'm talking about had 60,000 people. Many cities, small cities, would be about that many people. 60,000 people. The head of the Buchenwald camp was a woman called Dr. Elsa Koch. Look it up on your computers. 
and the female murderers of the world. She is listed and the female murderers. Dr. Elsa Koch is the one that was in charge of the whole 60,000 people. She was in charge of the guards. She was in charge of the administration. She took men to bed at night, shot them in the morning, especially men that had tattoos on their bodies. Out of the skin of these men, she made, or she had them, she had people make parasols, umbrellas, purses out of human skin, especially from men that had tattoos on their skin. I was at her trial. I was a witness two years after my liberation at the Buchenwald high-ranking SS officer trial and I saw her and I saw the purses and umbrella like one of each in a glass case made out of the human skin. She was given the death sentence because everybody knew that she shot these men but she fooled them. She became pregnant by an American sergeant of the guards. So they had to commute it to a life sentence because she was pregnant. And she was released for good behavior. She was released after 15 years. I read it in the Winnipeg Free Press after 15 years that she was released. I was told that the, on the computer in the, on the, her story they say that she also committed suicide after she was released from jail. She had a boy in jail, a baby, and she lived afterwards for a while, I don't know how long. So I was in Buchenwald for maybe six, seven, eight weeks, I'm not sure, maybe two months or so. And, and people were being brought in from other camps. And finally they organized what they called the Death March. 2,000 of us, including me, were taken out from Buchenwald camp. We were marched out and we were marched for three months, day in and day out, every day of the week. We were marched from, from Buchenwald towards the French-Swiss uh, uh, border, southwestern Germany. The first night we were housed on a farm, a large farm, and I was lucky enough to be able to get in, into the barn for the night to sleep in the hay or straw, I think it was straw, uh, in the barn. And I decided in the morning, it was just at the spare of the moment, I decided, hey, let them march off. I'm gonna stay hidden there for as long as I can, and then I'm gonna go back east, and hopefully I'm gonna be liberated by the Russian troops by the Soviet army. 
But I wasn't the only guy with that smart idea. There must have been about 40 or 50 or maybe 60 of us. I don't know. And when they started to shoot into the straw, when they realized that we were missing, I heard some screams. A couple of people that were hit by bullets didn't come out. But when they let in those German Shepherd dogs, a whole bunch of us jumped down, came out, and we were put against the outside wall to be shot for attempting to escape, for hiding. And I watched 10 SS men, I counted them, with their rifles just waiting for the order. The Christians, the Poles, the Ukrainians, the others that were there, uh, uh, they went down on their knees and they prayed to Mother Mary, to Jesus. And the Jewish people were saying the Shema Yisrael, pray to God in the Hebrew. God didn't help us. But the Pollock yelled out, let's run. And the Germans did not understand Polish. So the whole bunch of us, we started to run. So everybody started to run. They caught most of them, not me. I, I was lucky enough to run through them. They didn't catch me into the 2,000 men that were assembled to march off. I survived. And we kept on marching every day. I don't know, 10, 12, 15 hours a day. I don't know, till dark. And it was snowing. And then later on, when we got for the south, it was raining. It was the March of 1945. And we got wet and cold. And we didn't have adequate, not enough clothing. And people gave up. As we were marching, I could see dozens of people. And I'm telling you, dozens of men laying beside the road or in the ditch covered their heads with the cap, the face covered their face with the cap of what we had so you should not see when they're going to be shot. And they were all shot that were lying at the side of the road or in the ditch. And then there was two SS men on motorcycles driving back and forth. 2,000 men is a long column. And they were driving back and forth every half an hour or so that we, we, I saw them. And that's all they were doing is shooting those people where they were alive or not, they shot them again. One day, they marched us in into a small concentration camp because the guards needed to have a rest to go lay down for the night. So they put us into the camp, but not into the barracks, just uh, on the ground. Somebody came over, touched me on the shoulder, says to me, Gottfried? And I said, yes. He said, don't you recognize me? I'm your cousin. Would you have a piece of bread or potato to give me? He looked like a walking corpse. I don't know what I looked like. We had no mirrors at all. But 
he didn't look human ready. And he told me that they haven't eaten for several days. And because if you don't eat for several days, your mind also goes dead practically. So he, he did not remember how many days. And he told me people were already eating the corpses on the, from on the ground, their flesh. I didn't have any bread to give him or a potato. Did he live for another day or two? I don't know. So next morning the march was off again. And as I mentioned to you, we were marched day in and day out for three months on the highways, not on the main highway, on the smaller highway. So we passed by villages and towns and nobody threw a piece of bread at us that I know of. Nobody threw a potato or an apple. Did they hate us so much? Or were they afraid of us? Or were they afraid of the, of the SS that were guarding us? To every five of us, there was one SS man. Most of the time, one SS man was marching right beside me and kicking people and hitting people with his rifle because some people uh, lagged behind. It was awful. Many nights we were either, we either spent in a small forest or in the middle of a field, farmer's field, to spend the night there. Later on, they marched us at night and we slept in the forest or on the ground during the day because uh, if we were marching during the day, we might have looked like an army, like a like a German, we could have been bombed by the Allied forces, by the British, by the American, or we were still in Eastern Germany, maybe by the Soviets. Finally, we came to a fork road, went two different directions, and I don't know why, they didn't know which way to go. They sent one of the guards into, into town that we had passed by. And when he came back, the guard that was marching right beside me, like to every, we were five men in a row. So one in this row, one in that row, and then again. So he, he, he walked ahead to see what's going on as he walked ahead, I jumped out of line over the corpses that were lying on the road, over the ditch. I saw a hay wagon without a, uh, without a horse, just a wagon with hay in the field. I dropped my pants, pretending that, that I'm trying to, to make and nobody saw me. And I sat there under that, uh, that wagon 15, 20 minutes, I don't know how long, with my pants down. And nobody came for me and nobody saw me. Had they seen me, I would have been shot again. And they marched off. 
and I said to him, and then I decided to run. I'm going to run into the forest. And then I remembered, all of a sudden I remembered that there's two on the motorcycles driving back and forth, shooting people. About five, ten minutes later, I did see them drive by on their motorcycles. And I did see them shoot the people at the side of the road. And I sat there until they drove off and I ran into the forest. And I roamed the forest and I found a large dugout. Maybe 15, 20 feet in diameter, not deep, just a shallow dug out with sand in it, but I also found German army uniforms, German soldiers capitulated, they gave up, they changed into civilian clothes and they left their army clothes on that spot. There must have been, I don't know how many, a dozen or more of these uniforms. I put on a, a jacket, an, a German army jacket on me to keep me warm because I, I was soaking wet. It had been raining for the last few days again. I also found a large can of German army that I assumed would be army food. And I cut it open with the sharpened end of my spoon. And sure enough, it was a stew. Potatoes and gravy and some meat. It was cold and I ate half of it. It was good. I hadn't eaten for several days. I was starved. I ate half of that can of food and I suffered. I had dysentery, diarrhea, for more than two weeks. I was sick like a dog. I, my stomach wasn't used to food. My stomach wasn't used to having potatoes and gravy and some meat in it. And then I, ran back. I spent a, a couple of days in the forest and I ran to a neighboring, not, far, not too far away, to a farm that I only saw one farm in the whole area. So he asked the Polish woman, young woman that worked there on that farm, every farmer, every factory, every shop had workers, people, that they brought in from different parts of Europe, from France, from Holland, from Poland, <coughs> Czechoslovakia and all other countries to work there because their own men were drafted into the army. So the, far, so the girl the Pol who happened to be Polish, I was able to talk to her. He told her to give me a chunk of a piece of bread or slice of bread with butter and milk and, uh, and I ate it. I was starved. And then I asked permission to go to sleep in his uh, uh, barn where he had straw or hay whatever. So I will, eventually I was walking up, maybe an hour or two or three later, I don't know, by, the, by a French worker uh, that could speak German also already a little. Uh, the German soldiers came to get hay for their horses and uh, uh, they were afraid that 
the farmer kept the soldiers uh, drinking liquor. He didn't want them to catch me alive in his barn. He, they might shoot him for that. Anyway, four, five days, I was hiding out. I crossed the road. Somebody yelled. And I looked around. I saw two men. And I realized they're not German soldiers. And I did not understand what they were saying. But they, they ordered me in the French to stop. They took me prisoner because I wore a German army jacket. So they took me prisoner as a German soldier, put me into a POW camp with Germans. I happened to see somebody, one of the Germans, speak French to one of the guards. So I asked him to interpret that uh, I am not German, I'm an escapee from a concentration camp. And he told the guard that uh, in French, I was taken away to the high-ranking officer. I was liberated with a certificate that he printed out. And I was assigned to a woman's house she lived there by herself with her little girl. Her husband was in the, <coughs> in the German army, maybe already a prisoner, maybe not. And um, I found when I, when I went out from the house the next morning, oh, I couldn't fall asleep on the couch. It was too comfortable, too soft. For three years, I've never slept in a bed. I've never walked on the sidewalk. We were dehumanized. So it took me a long time to be able to walk, to stay on the sidewalk. I, always kept finding myself on the road. I found a, a dead horse that a bomb killed. People were cutting it up. I brought a chunk of meat to, to my landlady. <coughs> so I had a good dinner with meat on it. Excuse me. And I was liberated. I was in Germany for another two and a half years as a DP, a displaced person, hoping, waiting, and asking for any country to let me in the United States, Israel. Finally, I found out that I have relatives in Canada. By that time, I had already found my, my brother who was alive. He survived a different concentration camp in Austria. Found him by accident. It's another story. If you, if you want to hear, hear that story, read it in the book. Lucky to survive. I survived. I was lucky. Oh, and the money from this book goes to, to the museum here. It's $20, $20 my whole life story. I came to Canada to my relatives after being 
in Germany as a displaced person. I, I worked, I got married, I have a family, I have four daughters, seven grandchildren. Now Canada is the best, one of the best countries in the world. Canada lets in immigrants from all over the world. Not in the 1930s and the 1940s when my people, when the Jewish people were begging. Even those that had money, even those that had jewels, they wouldn't, Canada wouldn't let anybody in. When we were desperate to try and survive. You've heard of the, of the ship that Canada would let the people board. Now it's a good country. I hope you guys will finish off high school. Maybe many of you will go to university. You will get an education. You will be the good citizens of this country. Any questions? <laughs>